Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, this is the second all angle session for the 22 23 academic year. We'll be hosting two sessions in the fall. Um, how many of you are familiar with all angles and its intention? I see. Okay, a lot of you aren't. So All Angles was created to offer students an opportunity to hear um, about really important and complex societal issues from a variety of perspectives along the political continuum. And it's, it's not a lecture series and it's not a debate series. What it is is a discussion between content experts and then you're gonna have an opportunity to ask questions of them individually or of us as a group. Um, and it's supposed the the session the series is supposed to demonstrate how complex all of our issues are that we're dealing with and um, what we need to do in order to have productive dialogue, how we can learn to disagree in a better way um, so that we can move forward working together. Um, in 2021, we surveyed the student body and received over 1,400 student responses that identified societal issues that were important. So of those responses, there were um, three top issues that were identified by Oakland campus students. Uh, the first top issue was democracy, the second was race, and the third was climate change. So um, this is our session that we're going to be touching on climate change by focusing on um, one of uh, its greatest contributors, energy. Um, and we have some specialists with us today that Aurora is going to introduce you to in a little bit, but um, we're really thankful that you're all here. I'm going to go over a couple things with you about guiding principles of the All Angles session. Um, so that we all know kind of the tone and the atmosphere that we're trying to uphold and the, um, the values that we're trying to promote within the series. First and foremost, because we're talking about bringing in people who don't necessarily agree, right, on hot topics. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that Absolutely, positively, anyone who will have an all angles platform will adhere to the respect and value of all people. Number two, we really do encourage enthusiastic and civil dialogue. Um, we're requiring that there's evidence-based and data-driven uh, discussions. So we will not, um, we're gonna try and avoid um, you know, propaganda, or political talking points, but really get into the meat of the matter. Um, we're also going to build on the critical importance of diversity um, in the exchange and creation of ideas. So one of the things that the Institute of Polit Politics does on a regular basis is we address a number of issues like education, health, human services, environment, economic development, workforce development um, with elected officials and civic leaders and community members and um, people from both parties, all levels of government. And that is tough, right? Like bringing all those people together to solve a problem. And what we ask them to do when they come to the room is to leave their political brand at the door. We're gonna focus on the issue that we're talking about. And that's what we wanna do here too. And it's really important to talk to um, about differing, ideas or different perspectives, because um, oftentimes it's through our differences that we innovate. So um, that is a critical importance to all angles. And then lastly, but certainly um, actually most importantly, is that we um, believe that um, all angles values, culture, and faith are foundational aspects of the American democratic society. And so um, we respect um, values from across the, the spectrum um, and acknowledge that um, those are foundational aspects of democracy. Okay, 
just want to let you know, like, in addition to that, we have another event coming up <laughs> on November 11th, which is not an all angles series, but it is called um, the Never Spectator uh, Forum, part of the Elsie Hillman Civic Forum. Leah Lizarondo, she's the CEO and co-founder of 412 Food Rescue. She's been internationally recognized as an innovator in social entrepreneurism. She's going to be talking about addressing um, food insecurity through a, technolo a technology platform and how she's done that. And she had the idea when she was a student and then moved from there. Okay, so First, I would like to introduce you to Aurora Sherrard. Um, Aurora is the executive director of the university's sustainability office. Um, I need your bio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, She's the executive director of the sustainability office of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she's tasked with enabling uh, the Pitt sustainability plan. Has anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, which formalizes decades of university led and partnered green initiatives. I've known Aurora for oh, 20 years, yeah. about 20 years, we, when she was the executive director of the Green Building Alliance. Um, she's a passionate, um, smart um, person in the field of um, green building and sustainability. So, Aurora, I'm going to just turn it over to you and then you can facilitate the rest. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. So how are you guys today? You ready for a good conversation? Okay, so you heard I'm the Executive Director of Sustainability at Pitt. I've been here for about four and a half years. Um, at Pitt, we define sustainability as balancing equity, environment, and economics so current and future generations can thrive. And this conversation today about energy is all of those things, right? I fully expect you're gonna hear about equity, you're gonna hear about environment, you're gonna hear about economics, and you're gonna hear about it from some different perspectives. Um, but before I introduce our first speaker, I wanna ask you guys a question. So I'm gonna go back to the, the topic of this conversation is the global demand for energy in our environment. So I'm gonna ask you on a scale of five, five first, five, four, three, two, one, how you feel about your knowledge and experience with energy. So who feels like they're a five? They're an expert in energy. Dr. Hermio and Dr. Tinker, please raise your hands. Okay. <laughs> okay, who feels like they're four? They may not be an expert, but they're pretty dangerous in, in a room. They know what they're talking about. No fours. Okay, three. You, you sort of have a, an, an average knowledge. Okay, I've got, I've got a few threes. Okay, a two, you're, you're slightly knowledgeable about energy. You know what happens when you flip on the light switch. You, you, okay, good. And a one, nothing. You have no energy knowledge. You're just here for the conversation or the food. Yeah, it's okay. I saw some ones, but that's fair game. Okay, it's good. Thanks, thanks for playing. Um, so what uh, Sam said, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna have two speakers. Uh, first, we're gonna hear uh, from Dr. Tinker for about 10 minutes. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. Jaramillo. And then I'm going to ask some questions and then we're gonna open up to you guys to ask questions. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna get us started uh, by introducing Dr. Scott Tinker, who's the professor and all day endowed chair in the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm not gonna read his full bio, um, but he has great expertise in geology. He has his own show on PBS. Uh, he's written books. He has a, an acknowledged TED talk. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Scott. Good to be with you today, and and uh, thanks for welcoming a Texan here, although I just came from BC. So some things to share. I want to show you, can everybody see the slides? If you can't, I'll get out of the way. Um, so now, which one makes it go forward? I'm going to try that one. Some philosophy. And by the way, I talked to a few folks ahead. We had some environmental scientists. We had a sociologist. We had a chemist, business an Italian major, and that was just one person. Um, so I don't know how you keep track of all that, but uh, appreciate all the disciplines here. The mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Wouldn't that be nice these days? Just to entertain some thoughts. You don't have to agree with one another, but you don't have to accept them, but let's just entertain them. Let's have some civil dialogue. And that's why I love this event and why I said I'd be happy to come here and do this. And now I'm not, there we go. So look, here's your Dr. Seuss moment, ready? You can clap at the end because I practiced hard for this. Our homes and our phones, our pets and our jets, 
our heaters and our beaters, our water, our daughters, our sons, and everything you wear, um, our packs and our snacks, our frames and our games, our pace, our waste, our sight, our light, our noses, our clothes, our wheels, and our meals. Everything depends on energy. And you're probably thinking, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, yeah, we know about gasoline and, and the plug, but all this stuff and more. And the problem with this is that the light and the food and the home and the clean water, about half the people in the world don't have today. And I've been fortunate. I've traveled a lot. Those are the countries I've been in, 60 of them, and they're color-coded by number of visits. And in that travel, I've met people. I met this grandfather about my age in Ethiopia. He had tears in his eyes when he told me his grandkids, those are some of them, had just come out of the bush. They'd had something he never had, and they were in school for the first time ever. And here in Nepal, Sanakanchi cooks with wood. This is all from, I took either, took or I'm in these pictures. These are from our film, Switch On, if you have a chance to see that. Cooks indoors with wood like three billion other people in the world today. And we went to the Seni Memorial Hospital just nearby where kids are dying every week of, of pneumonia and moms of cancer and getting cataracts. Three million people a year die from indoor smoke. That's what COVID-19 killed globally in 2020. Every year. And we can address it. It's not that difficult. Um, if we go over here to this clicker is, is, is being very slow. <laughs> Let me come closer. Here we are in, in Kenya. This little girl is in a church which doubles as a school and kids are coming home from in their uniforms across mounds of garbage and polluted water and soils. In the 60 countries I've visited, without exception, the worst environments in the world are where it's poor. They just can't afford to clean it up. They have other priorities that they have to spend time on. Here we sit, come over here to, to Vietnam, and Thon in that red house is, has a crippled son. They live there, and she brings him on that plank across on her back every day so he can go to school. In India, we see dense demand for energy, a very dense population, and, and from the poorest to the poor in many ways to the richest of the rich, and come over to Colombia. And we brought first solar here. Um, you see that panel array. It's, it would power about half of one of your houses, but it mud huts and thatch roofs, lights and ceiling fans and a refrigerator freezer. And these kids that are part of the Arawako uh, indigenous people in the Sierra Nevada, half of them will die before they reach adulthood of a tooth infection or dysentery. It won't kill us. You won't die of a tooth infection here. And that last night we turned on the lights. They had one, we mounted one light on a pole. I was with the mama or the chief. They'd never seen each other at night in their own village except over a fire. So this was a pretty momentous time for all of us. So why am I showing you all this? It's because about three quarters of the world live in Latin America, Asia, and Africa today, three out of every four people. And it's growing faster than developed economies. And it's a paradox. Energy won't end poverty, but you can't get out of poverty without energy. It's one of the great challenges in our world today. It's time to power the people. And look, there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who are good at math and those who aren't. So uh, which of the three are you? Yeah. So let's do some simple arithmetic. Here we are with energy consumption by a human being in these different countries. We featured Ethiopia and Kenya in our film. Kilowatt hour, you might not speak. So there's my fridge. My fridge consumes nine times more electricity than a person in Ethiopia three times. I have two fridges. I'm a geologist, I have a beer fridge, okay. We keep them in the garage in Texas, that's real efficient. Um, 20 times more than a human being. That's what energy poverty means. So here's a map of the global income in the world. The reds and the yellows are severely poor, like about $3 a day of total income, about half what you'd spend on one Starbucks for a family. They need some energy. Uh, it's, it's centered, I'm going to get this right, centered around sub-equatorial regions, but it's everywhere. They need energy to get started, affordable energy, just something to get started. Now, in the emerging economies and the purples, 
the developing economies, they need secure energy. They have some, but it's not reliable to them. So they need reliable energy. The challenge again is about three out of four people live in the places I just highlighted. In the rich world, the blues, we want it secure. We want it clean, climate secured. So look at these different needs around the world today. Of the 60 countries I've been in, I'm, unfortunately, climate isn't front of mind to about 80% of those people. Other priorities are. So you bring all that together and you say, what is sustainable? To who? Where? What government system? What economic system? What educational system? What energy sources do they have? What does sustainable mean really to the world today? Environmentally, we know climate is a major issue that we have to focus on, but so is the air, and so is the water, and so is our land, and those of you in environmental science study these things. It's interconnected. One of the most powerful things I've read recently, imagine living a life so carefully that there are no signs you lived at all. Wouldn't that be something? How many of us do that? So global energy issues in the environment, climate security, a major one. Energy poverty, I'm having to anticipate the click. It's coming. I call it the radical middle. You know, it's radically lonely most of the time, but it's where all the action is. And we hear there's no option, we have to address climate. True. I promise you every leader on the planet thinks there's no option, they have to address energy security. And the same with poverty, there's no option. We can't leave 3 billion people impoverished in the world today. That's not just, that's not equitable. So when you start to think about this, there are trade-offs to these things in this radically overlapping middle space. Seven-year policy migration, before Paris, we were down in the economy and then we had post-Paris toward climate and COVID-19 moved us back to thinking about the economy and then net zero emissions policies in Europe. And then last year, a year ago, COP26 happened, pulled us strongly toward climate. And then Mr. Putin said, no, I'm going into Ukraine. And I've been to Kiev in 1982, right after my college. It's hard to meet for me to think about what's going on there today. But that brought us toward security again, globally. And where are we? We've got the radical middle surrounded in seven years. And this is the kind of global challenge that we face in these things. What is sustainable? Is it environmentally sustainable? Is it economically sustainable? Is it energetically sustainable? And the answer, of course, is yes. We have to do these things. We have to balance those things as we move forward. So you look from left to right, from biomass all the way to the densest forms of energy as you go from left to right there. It's processes. A lot has to happen for biofuels. You grow, you process, you refine it, you transport it, you combust it, you burn biofuels and biomass. On solar, wind, and, and, and batteries, which are kind of a special case on the left, we can talk about in Q&A if you want to. You got to mine for all the metals. You got to make all the stuff. And then you have to deploy it and transmit it on power lines otherwise. And then you dump it in landfills for the most part. Where do the panels and the batteries and the turbines go? Are they inert or are they toxic? And at scale. And then oil and gas and coal, all of it, mine, manufacture, drill, refine, transport, burn. The challenge with all these things at scale is they're not renewable. When I mine, I'm an earth scientist, I don't mind mining. Doesn't bug me, bug some people. But when you have to mine and make and dump when it wears out and do it again and again, it's not renewable. That's a concept we've created in inner but it doesn't exist in energy. Don't throw anything at me, please. There are policemen up here. You know, <laughs> When I say that, they got to protect me. You can check out my TED Talk and I go deeper into this. We got to be completely factual and factually complete. I said that to the US Senate about last year. Factually complete is hard. Here's one example of it. Color codes are here. We're increasing coal and oil demand in the world still. We're burning more coal and oil, still increasing. It's dense, but it makes a lot of CO2. Natural gas and nuclear are increasing, they're dense. They make less CO2. And we're increasing hydro and solar and wind tremendously. They're not dense, less CO2 or limited CO2. 
they're trade-offs. There's nothing perfect. If you look at the increase in coal and oil since 1965, it's more than all the other energy in the world combined today. Just the increase, that's the data. That's not an energy transition, we're just adding more energy. It's completely factual to say solar and wind are growing faster than anything else in the world. You've learned this. Look at it. There's the data, exponential growth. To make it factually complete, we have to scale it. It's right in the data. There they are. And they're not even keeping up, close to keeping up with demand for energy in the world today. Not close. This is the challenge of scale. This is the, the things we have to really dive into to be able to address some of these big issues as we go forward. Energy transition is energy addition and emission reduction. Those are the components of it. So I'll sit down here in just a second. I gave a TED talk, you're welcome to check it out. We got a PBS series, it's a talk show, just this format. Two guests, they don't agree, really high level smart people. We have civil dialogue and dive deep into these issues, 25 minutes. So a couple final thoughts for you. No one owns the truth. We just seek it. We don't own the truth, especially in science. We just seek it. Shaming is destructive. Let's cancel shaming. The next time somebody is online in your socials and they shame somebody, cancel that. Hey, no shame. We've got to have a civil dialogue. Energy environment, we've got to address these together or they both fail. That's the great dual challenge. And the sustain, oops, sorry, energy sustainability, it's not simple. I appreciate the ones and the twos and the threes and the fours. I wouldn't raise my hand as a five. And I've been studying energy for 40 years. I was born into it. It's not simple, but it's solvable if we deal with all the information, right? So I'm really pleased to be here with Paulina and Aurora and, and Sam, thanks for inviting me. And I look forward to our conversation. Thanks. With that, I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Paulina Jaramillo, who's a professor in engineering and public policy uh, and co-director of the Green Design Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Had to travel a little less far to get here than, than Scott did from Texas, just down the street. Um, of things that, that Paulina is known for. Um, she spent a year in Rwanda and has a courtesy appointment at CMU's campus there. Uh, she hails from uh, Medellin, Colombia, um, and she is also a lead author on Working Group 3 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report that just came out recently. Paulina. Uh, yep. Um, so, uh, Aurora failed to mention that we went to grad school together. <laughs> um, so we have similar backgrounds. Um, so I'm gonna briefly, I think I have fewer slides, um, but maybe more numbers in some of them. Does this work? So this is going back to some of the issues that um, Scott mentioned before. And in these figures that I'm gonna show, the colors are more important than the actual numbers. This figure shows energy use per, per person around the world. And so we are here, obviously, one of the highest um, energy consumers in the world um, per capita. I'm originally from Colombia and I lived in Rwanda, which is somewhere over here, it's a tiny country. So clearly um, demand for energy in the poorest areas of the world is much lower than um, in, in our world, in the developed world. Um, this is a subset of that information. This is access to electricity. So the percentage of the population that actually has a connection to electricity that can turn on a light uh, at their house. And most of the people without a connection to electricity are in Africa. Um, there are some countries in Africa where less than 10% of the population have access to a connection of ele for electricity. And it's not working. Okay. Um, I think Scott mentioned these, even access to clean cooking facilities. So we are used to cooking with natural gas or with um, electricity, which are pretty clean. Um, in most of Africa and in parts of Asia, a lot of the population re relies on traditional sources 
of um, of biomass for cooking. And sometimes this just means like three stones or very often it means three stones and fire. And that's how they cook. This has serious implications for not just economic well-being, but also health um, and other development goals. Now, the, big, the bigger challenge coming our way or a bigger challenge coming that way is that population growth in the next 75 years is going to be happening in developing countries, uh, particularly in East Africa, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so the population in North America is stabilizing and remaining even slightly low in Europe, maybe decreasing. In Asia, there's actually trends suggesting that population, which Asia has the highest population right now, population is actually decreasing and will start decreasing, like it will start decreasing even more after 2050, whereas Africa may have 4.5 billion people by the end of the century, 2.5 billion people by the middle of the century. And so we have an issue here where currently the populations that have the least access to energy are also in the places where the population is going to be increasing the most. To make things worse, um, we have climate change and the contribution to climate change. So again, the units are not as important as the scholars. This is the cumulative CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and cement production. So this is how much CO2 emission we have, like globally, the countries have produced since, the, since, the, since 1750. And CO2 is the main gas that contributes to climate change. And so again, uh, the US, has the largest cumulative uh, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, but even China is catching up. China is actually currently the largest emitter and their cumulative contribution is increasing. By contrast, the, the countries where there's poor people with low energy supply and where population is gonna be growing have had a marginal contribution to carbon dioxide. That does not mean that they won't be affected by climate change. In fact, some of the most vulnerable populations to climate change are in developing countries, in particular tropical areas. So in Asia, South America, and um, Africa. So again, this combination of effects, low energy poverty, small contribution to the problem could potentially have some of the more serious effects. Um, or the vulnerability. So I argue that providing energy that enables human well-being while meeting climate stabilization goals is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. Now, when I say um, providing energy that enables human well-being, it isn't about providing basic energy access. Providing basic energy access is not gonna be a problem for climate, right? The challenge is, but providing basic energy access, which means uh, having light bulbs, being able maybe to have a TV, some very basic things. So basic energy access is light bulbs, some like if you go to rural communities where these things are happening, the things that people get are light bulbs, TVs, and cell phone charging. Now, there are benefits to having lighting for education. I'm not gonna say that there aren't benefits to watching TV because I watch a lot of TV, but though that energy is not what's gonna lead to economic growth and economic well-being. So while meeting universal energy access goals is really important, that's not where the challenge, I mean, and difficult. It's not like it's simple, it's difficult, but that's not where the biggest challenge lies in terms of climate change. We're gonna need higher levels of energy for transportation, for agriculture, for industry, in these areas of the world where population is growing, they have very little energy currently and they need economic growth. And so that level of energy is where I think the challenge comes in, in terms of all doing that while also mitigating climate change. Uh. Um, so many people believe that climate mitigation is unaffordable. Uh, 
And increasingly, that is not the case. This figure, which came from the IPCC report on climate mitigation that was published earlier this year, show the trends of cost of some of the most common low carbon technologies, right? The cost of solar energy has decreased tremendously in the last 20 years. So has um, the cost of offshore wind, the cost of some concentrated solar power, and even the cost of batteries, which are critical for vehicle electrification and for renewable integration. So these are technologies that are crucial. These are low carbon technologies that are crucial for, for meeting climate goals and their costs are increasing, have increased drastically and are, continue, are gonna continue to increase. The other thing when we talk about unaffordable is that climate change is unaffordable. This is a, oops, this is a figure that shows from a paper, recent paper that shows what the impact on GDP, my own global GDP might be as a result of climate change. And so if you focus on like 2050, RCPs, those are different levels of climate. So the worst case scenario would be RCP 8.5. That is by 2050, close to a 10% reduction in global GDP. Um, the, the, the closer you get to the most optimistic scenario, the, the lower the impact on um, global GDP. So when we talk about climate mitigation and energy transitions being unaffordable, we also need to talk about the costs of not taking action. Um, now, it is hard and there is no single bullet. There are no single bullets. Um, this is a result showing um, some work we have done at Carnegie Mellon looking at what it may look like, what the US energy system may look like if we are to reach net zero CO2 emissions. And so this is by sector. And so in this scenario by 2050, emissions are net zero. And what that means is we have some positive emissions from some sectors, but we have what it's called carbon dioxide capture or carbon dioxide removal to compensate for any positive emissions. And in order to get to this place of net zero, which is what we need to reach a 1.5 degree target, um, we see a very broad mix, right? We see wind and solar, we also see biomass, but we still see natural gas and some petroleum um, and nuclear, right? So it isn't like there is one single solution, uh, one single technology, that is gonna solve the problem. And this is for the US, if you think globally, it's gonna look somewhat similar, but because we're still using carbon-based fuels, fossil fuels, we will need these technologies that mitigate the residual emissions from those fuels. Um, so I argue that decarbonization, uh, so reducing, carbon emissions to meet climate stabilization targets is a more, even in developing countries is, a more, is not a choice, but a more imperative. Um, the research that I've done and the trends we have seen suggest that the cost of climate change would likely be higher than the cost of reducing emissions. Um, we have the technologies and the capital to start this transition. We don't have all of the technologies ready to meet net zero, but we have the technologies that can put us on that path. And we're working on the technologies that have to be in place by the middle of the century. So we need to continue investing on those technologies. Um, I would also, based on the discussion, I would also suggest decarbonization, the, the, the Venn diagram and the intercept of the Venn diagram between climate, um, what was it? So climate security, climate security, energy security, and affordability uh, is much bigger than we think, right? Climate reducing emissions. One of the challenges Europe is facing with the Ukraine is the reliance on a fossil fuel that Russia controls. Uh, so reducing the dependence of foreign sources of fossil fuels helps with um, energy security. Uh, there are a lot of environmental co-benefits to climate mitigation, particularly air pollution. 
there are trade-offs and there are some negative, there isn't anything humans do that hasn't, doesn't have a, a negative impact. So there are environmental impact trade-offs with climate mitigation. Uh, and then for energy security, again, I don't think, and the, some of the work I'm doing suggests that climate mitigation um, and low carbon transitions is not inconsistent with providing energy for the, for the poorest in the world. Um, I do think that the challenge is who pays for these. Mm -hmm. And there is a discussion there about the moral obligations of the wealthier countries that have contributed to mo most to climate change on how to support low carbon development in those countries. Thank you. Let's give our speakers a hand. So first question, we're gonna, we're gonna start with Scott. We hit global energy supply and demand pretty hard in, in the past 20 minutes. Many of us are very privileged in the US as, as we saw where we have very reliable energy supply and fairly stable pricing. Um, but what did we not talk about? What do you want to emphasize um, so our audience can better understand global energy supply and demand? Maybe touch a little bit uh, on coal and nuclear to start. Sure. Most of the world doesn't live like us. And it's really hard to know that until you get out there and experience it. And it's not just sort of like us. It's at all like us. So that's that's to me the great moral challenge in the world options matter if you went to your closet in the morning and there was one outfit every single morning and you went to eat and there was one food option for every meal you probably go i'm getting kind of tired of this single option energy options matter i wrote a piece in fortune just last week on optionality in europe Europe is gonna go through the worst winter that it's been through since the second world war. And it's mostly because of policy. People will die in Western Europe. Industries are closing in Western Europe and moving where? To China, to Texas. I'm not making up, I can show you a million articles, minis, battery factories, et cetera. So, Options matter. We can't legislate them away and expect things to work out. Mandating certain kinds of things are gone. And California does a lot of this. I've been there a lot and I'll be talking to the legislature soon. Doesn't work out very well. It has good intentions. I'm too old to judge intentions, but I do look at outcomes and it doesn't work out very well. You end up with no choices. And when you have no choices, people like Mr. Putin say, well, I'm going to take advantage of that. And he has. And there's a tough set of responses that are coming. That's a big global thing to think about. Energy optionality. Okay. The other thing I think is the environmental impacts. Um, we have to stop, I think, thinking about energy as some have a bunch of impacts and others don't. We see the impacts of coal and oil and gas. They're the scale. That's 85% of our energy in the world it comes from those. We see what it takes to develop them. It hurts the environment, period. I showed mining and you know you got to drill and transport and you refine it and burn it. It goes in the atmosphere. So do all the other forms of energy when they start to scale. The world's metals are mined in different places, but they're processed now. 80% of the key metals to make turbines and solar panels and batteries are processed in China. China had a Belt and Roads Initiative, and it was brilliant. Congratulations, China. They bought the world's resources for solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries. They have a stated policy to lead in that area. Just like it gets pretty tricky when Mr. Putin cuts off gas, or OPEC cuts off oil, it could get pretty tricky when China cuts off the batteries for your EVs. And they have the power to do that today. I'm not blaming China or accusing China. I'm saying that's the reality of global politic. They're all resources. They're all volatile. The price of lithium for lithium ion batteries has gone up 900% in the last three years. And we haven't even started to make them at scale yet. There are only 16 million EVs in the world. 
we're supposed to go to 700 million by 2040. Think of the scale. So this options and impacts, no form of energy is without impacts. It all comes from the earth, captures energy in various forms, and we either emit it to the atmosphere or we dump it back in the earth. I've got to start thinking a little deeper about these things. That's why I'm so thrilled you're here to talk about it. Thanks, Polly. Maybe build on that a little bit and talk about um, global energy policy and how we account for environmental and social impacts like those Scott is talking about and others uh, in our global policy, energy policy discussions. So there is in global energy policy. There's um, bilateral treatments, uh, treaties, there might be um, UN sponsored agreements. Most of them are not binding. So like the climate negotiations and the Paris Agreement, which set the goal of 1.5 degree target is not binding. There are global markets. That's probably where you see most of the policy. Like if you would talk about po global policy, it's more about markets, right? And because there is, that's where things are uh, changing a lot. Um, so, and particularly we see it with the oil markets where what we do is not necessarily like what we do, the US is the largest, it's like producing more oil than it has ever produced. And our oil prices are still increasing because our oil goes into a global market where prices are set at a global level. Uh, so the policies that individual countries pursue in their best interest will affect uh, what happens in the global market, um, especially for actually there's a, the, the, there's not a global market for natural gas and there's definitely not a, a global market for electricity. Um, so it really is fossil fuels. Um, I wanna point, I, I wanna go back to something Scott said. There are no, they say there is no free lunch, right? And that is, if we think about the environmental impacts of energy, that's also true. There isn't any source of energy that has no environmental impacts. And environmental impacts are very varied so it is from like varies from land use patterns. And so if we're using a lot of land to produce energy, what are we giving up? And some of that is maybe if you're doing bioenergy, you're giving up land that could be used for food production. If you're using um, land in, in Pennsylvania, a couple of years ago, there was a big concern about how we're using land for natural gas production and the disturbances in habitats and fragmentation of habitats as a result of natural gas production. And with wind and solar, you have concerns about um, land use and bat mortality is one that worries me uh, with wind um, and then mining. That does not mean they are all equal, They're equally bad or equally good. There is, so Aaron and I did our PhD on, on a method called life cycle assessment, where we look at the entire system from manufacturing, processing, mining, all the materials. And there are technologies that are factually less environmentally damaging uh, than others. Uh, and you, you have to have trade-offs. Maybe like one of them in wind, you have much more use of land than if you have a coal power plant. So you are assessing trade-offs within environmental impacts. Uh, but there are definitely plants, there are definitely technologies that are less damaging to the environment. And the same true, yes, reliance on Chinese batteries is a big concern. That's why there's a lot of focus on diversification of resources. There's a lot of focus on recycling and reuse of materials and batteries to reduce the impacts of mining. And there are technologies down the line to help with the, mitigate some of those impacts. Um, okay, mm -hmm. thanks. So Paulina brought up trade-offs, Scott. Uh, maybe you can address a, a few of those trade-offs, which you brought up in, in your presentation. Um, you can start with the environmental and social side, but maybe take that one step further, you know, as you expound, uh, including the trade-offs um, of energy globally, the, what does that mean for developed and developing economy countries, uh, and, and how do we balance those trade-offs? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Paulina just said. I couldn't have said it better. Um, you know, I'll give you a quick example. Maine, anybody from Maine? 
and we met earlier. Um, Maine has one of the largest lithium deposits in the nation. It's, a, it's in a pegmatite, a hard rock. Maine also overturned their governor with a 35 to nothing legislative veto to have any mining in Maine. So they won't mine it. Maine's legislature is also about to pass a law requiring mandating electric vehicles. Do you see the irony? We have to run on lithium ion batteries. We won't mine the lithium. And I'm not picking on Maine. I love Maine. My sister-in-law lives there and my niece. Okay. But this is the great challenge is we want these things, but we won't do it. I know Senator Hickenlooper very well. He's the only scientist in the Senate out of 100. He's a geologist from Colorado. We were close friends. I call him Hick. I was with him two weeks ago. I said, how's mining going in Colorado, Hick? We were together, not in front of anybody. Mr. Senator, he said, shut up, Scott. They're not going to be mining in Colorado, but they're mandate, mandating things. See, so that has to come from somewhere. California imports two thirds of its electricity. New York imports three quarters of its electricity. 39 states are net energy consumers. Only 11 are net producers. This is what Europe is facing. They don't produce enough. They have to bring it from somewhere else. It's not secure. So this is the great challenge. We want these things, but we aren't willing to do the things and we get ourselves in secure binding positions. And it's really important to understand that, okay? On a global basis, it's important to understand that trade drives a lot of things, but it's not free. We talk about free trade, but it's not free. You policy thinkers, legal thinkers, scholars in the room, business leaders, economists. You know these things. You're going to be learning about these things as you go off into your lives. Think deeply about how those things interact. It's really important. Otherwise, we end up thinking in binary terms, good and bad, clean and dirty, and it's not binary, and we're stuck. We look back and go, oops, intentions were good, but... So, so really, I want to share that on a global basis, is just thinking about these trade-offs that we face. Thanks. Um, I think one of those trade-offs, we, we heard the term, uh, and you've heard it a lot in different venues, right? Paulina said decarbonization uh, as a global and a national strategy. Sometimes you also hear the term carbon neutrality bandied about. Um, so Paulina, can you maybe start us off and unpack that term? Uh, a little bit for our audience. What do you mean when you say decarbonization? What do people mean nationally and globally? Will we still use fossil fuels? How many and for how long? Um, yeah, so I would mention decarbonization really means reducing carbon emissions, particularly CO2 emissions. The means like decarbonization in an ideal world is technology agnostic. The objective is not to, and this is a disagreement I've had even with some progressives. The objective should not be to increase the amount of renewable energy. The objective should be to decrease emissions, right? That's really the goal. Renewable energy may be a means of getting to that. And so when we talk about decarbonization, we talk about what are the pathways that would lead, lead us to re reducing or like seriously reducing or eliminating emissions of car carbon emissions that contribute to climate change, primarily um, carbon dioxide and um, methane, although there's others that are growing that are becoming problematic. And so if you think about it, it isn't, the objective is not to reduce the use of fossil fuels for the sake of reducing the use of fossil fuels. Um, and in fact, in the working group assessment report, you all, all of the scenarios analyzed that are consistent with a 1.5 degree target remain. There seems there is still a portion of energy that is from fossil based systems. Um, it is a reduction from what it is, we have. It's a reduction in global fossil fuel consumption, but it's not an elimination. 
Um, now, the caveat is the only way that we can continue using some fossil fuels and meet the climate stabilization goals is if we have carbon dioxide removal. And the chair of the working group three that wrote the report on climate mitigation in the press conference um, releasing the report says, CDR or carbon dioxide removal is likely unavoidable if we want to meet the 1.5 degree target. That technology is not currently in, ex in, we know about it, we have the fundamentals, but it is not at a technology readiness level that it can be deployed. That means we need to work on that technology now so that it's available in the middle of the century, so that it is deployable in the middle of the century. Having carbon dioxide, there's a lot of people and progressives that are very opposed to carbon dioxide removal because they see it as an excuse for continuing to use fossil fuels. That is not true because to meet climate stabilization targets, we need to reduce CO2 emissions, which means reducing the reliance on fossil fuels, not necessarily eliminating their use, but reducing their use and carbon dioxide removal. They're not mutually exclusive. It's not a net like a zero sum game. So, and in Africa, there's a big discussion about the role of natural gas. Africa doesn't have, well, East Africa specifically doesn't have that much oil. They don't have coal, uh, but they have natural gas. And so there's a big discussion about the role of natural gas in meeting their energy needs. And there are some sectors where there aren't many carbon, low carbon options like aviation. I didn't fly. He had to fly to get here. <laughs> um, <laughs> there aren't low carbon options right now for jet fuel. Mm -hmm. And so we might, and we're not gonna tell people not to fly, right? That is not realistic or, I mean, I guess you could have an ethical discussion about that, mm -hmm. uh, but we will need technologies. We will continue using fossil fuels for that. And we will need the technologies to manage those residual emissions. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a big conference coming up soon in Egypt called COP27, Conference of the Parties, the 27th year for climate discussions, and everybody's flying there. I am. <laughs> so you have to, to get around the world and meet like this. I, I do want to say one quick thing on fossil fuels. Not all fossil fuels are created equal. We can lump them together because they all come from, I'm a geologist again, sorry, but you know, dead organic stuff that gets packed together and heated and cooked and it makes oil and gas and coal. Coal is carbon. It's just packed up plants. It's mostly carbon. And some of it's not even good carbon. Like in Texas, we have lignite, it's junk. You have great coal here, anthracite. Actually, the word for coal in Spanish is carbon. Is carbon, right. Yeah, it's carbon. Now, Oil is a complex hydrocarbon, hydrogen and carbon chains. Natural gas is at least by, is CH4, four hydrogens to every carbon, by weight, a little more carbon, but mostly hydrogen in natural gas. A very different fuel. And so when you burn coal, you get socks and NOx and particulates that you breathe and mercury and other things. When you burn methane, I cook with it in my kitchen. I don't really worry about it much. There are some things but it's really different. And so the good maybe can't be the enemy or perfect as we transition. Uh, we've reduced our CO2 emissions in the US and Western Europe quite a bit from replacing coal with methane. There's more work to do like capturing the carbon. It's actually better to capture CO2 from a methane power plant than a coal plant. It's easier energetically and you get more intense CO2 to dispose of. So. There's some partnerships here. I love the conjunctive, the and. It's an and thing, right? If we keep agreeing like this, they're not going to believe what, uh, what kind of coffee do you drink? I might have different coffee tastes or something. But... She likes it with a lot of cream and sugar. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to open it up to you guys because I feel like we've had a very high level conversation and you have some detailed questions that haven't been answered here. So who wants to go first? Yeah. Did I see a hand over Don't here? Be shy. Somebody has, oh, yeah, I was going to say a four or five. You know, get, Can you hear me? Get us started, yeah. Um, hi. Uh, what do you think the likelihood of achieving net zero by 2050 is? <laughs> I 
<laughs> I have to remain optimistic. So, because otherwise I would just crawl in bed and not get up. So there's my answer. <laughs> Scott? What was your answer? I have to remain optimistic. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, a report just came out yesterday that I think it's 26 countries are on track for their pledges. The happened? New York Times article. Yeah. To the, yeah, today. I'm a scientist. Nothing is ever zero. But it's essentially zero. <laughs> okay. That we'll get net zero by 2050. That's only uh, 27 years away. And we're still increasing our use of coal in the world. And those plants last 60 years. And once you build them, it's unlikely to shut them down for much. It's just too much capital employed. Okay, so we need optionality fast for coal, full stop. Nuclear, you asked me to mention, I haven't, but nuclear technologies are interesting. I know it's scary to some people. Um, on a safety basis, just pure stats here, kilowatt hour basis, safest form of electricity on the planet. By far, okay. We can talk about that if you want. We can unpack that. <clears throat> Fission remains the source. Splitting uranium and thorium, make heat, boil water, make steam, turn a turbine, run a generator. It's just a different source of heat. China's building 50 new nuclear reactors today. They have another 100 on the books if they choose to go down that route. They're leading the world in nuclear. They should. Good for China. There's some cool technology coming that's different, smaller. Same fission, not fusion, fission, small modular reactors. Bill Gates is big on this. His company's TerraPower. Chris Levesque runs that company. Um, New Scale is another one out of Oregon. Uh, John Hopkins runs that company. And they're getting close. Patents are in. Romania is looking at deploying the very first small modular reactor. Smaller than the diameter of this room, they bury it in the ground. You could put it in lots of places like in Africa, in villages, and get zero emission electricity. The challenge, of course, is managing the waste. We can talk about the risks and, of that and how well it's done. But it's hard for me to envision a net zero world without nuclear. If we're, at, if we're willing to get after it and start to remove some of those hurdles, I'm more optimistic. It's got to be a, one of the wedges, one of the levers we throw. Okay. Right. That's my opinion. And not investing, so not investing in nuclear now can be very problematic if carbon dioxide removal does not materialize. Agreed. And so we have to hedge, right? Um, and so I don't envision the U.S. expanding nuclear, but we should not be decommissioning our current nuclear power plants. And I think there, I agree, there will be a role for nuclear. To be more honest on your answer, we currently do not see the evidence to suggest, I think technically we could meet net zero CO2 by the middle of the century. We do not, we have not taken the actions that we need to get there. Uh, and so that is on us, like that's political will or unwillingness really to, to set those policies, conflict, um, in value, our value system. And so as an engineer, I think it is technically possible, but we are not taking the actions to get us there. We have another question over here. Do we have any marathoners in the room? Anybody run marathons? Distance, you do? So when you set out to run your first one, you probably had a time goal, right? I mean, my, my, my third son just ran his first and probably his last forever. But uh, Let's say your goal was to run a three-hour marathon. That's cooking. What if you ran a three-hour and 10-minute marathon? Did you fail? Well, you didn't meet your goal. But maybe 310 is pretty darn close to three hours. And if we can get a lot of the emissions out, not net zero, but maybe net something, net 20, net 25, isn't that? So let's not make this goal so much a fixed locked in thing that we don't want to get up in the morning. You know, let's just make some great progress towards it. And I, hell, I'd be happy with a five hour marathon if I was running one today. Yeah. What do you run? Four hours. 
yeah, good. That's good. So I want to I want to underscore what Scott just said because climate anxiety is a real thing, right? And we know that climate change is the emergency that we're all facing right now, but we each have our own opportunity and scale for that opportunity, right? So when Paulina says it's on us, you know, she's probably thinking us as society, us as governments, us as countries. I see that as us as institutions, right? Us as corporations, us where we have our own scale of influence and domain. So when you walk out of here, you have that power, right? You are developing the knowledge, the power you will in your next profession, you will have that opportunity to make the change. There's an organization called Project Drawdown that has a new thing, like every job is a climate job, right? It doesn't matter if you work in human resources or finance or whatever, we all have this on us, right? We all make energy decisions that are connected, right? You have the tools. We just have to pull all the levers we can as fast as we can, when we can. We can't be making more bad decisions now. We have to make the best decisions we can make now, balancing the things that we know. Can I ask, answer one other? This is very brief for this. <laughs> all right, we, we are going to move on to thing, student Q&A though. Just, so. quick, just real quick. The only net zero thing that I really am passionate about is net zero poverty. Anything that goes against that, I'm against, okay? If we don't have net zero poverty on the planet, none of this works. We just continue to pull apart in wealth and access and privilege, and that doesn't work. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, a sort of pattern I've, noticed in like hearing things about climate is that there's often a trade-off between the global impact of reducing carbon emissions and the local impact of something like mining lithium or mining other metals used in batteries or um, increasing fracking to cut down on coal. Uh, my question is basically what's, what's your guys' take on uh, balancing the global harm versus the local harm of uh, energy production and different options. Um, okay, so actually I gave a class today on Calder Higgs efficiency. Uh, what, Calder Higgs efficiency as opposed to Pareto efficiency. Not, I'm not gonna go through that, but basically the ability, something is efficiency if the winners are able to compensate the losers for their loss. Um, and there's always winners and losers. Um, even in what we call win-win situations where you're reducing emissions of carbon and decreasing costs and reducing air pollution, which which could consider a uh, win-win, there's someone that is gonna lose. Um, and so that is a very difficult question to answer. I do think the negative costs or the negative impacts of a lot of things are overblown. So let's talk about jobs, which is one that is always comes up, right? Removing, reducing coal, that has led to a reduction in coal jobs. But that improving, increasing renewables has also offered an opportunity for increasing jobs. The problem is we have a like misalignment between the people losing the jobs and the people that could win the jobs. And that's where policy intervention can come in. That's where investing in retraining programs or we need batteries, right? We need lithium, then we need mining for lithium. That's a job that can make up for a loss of a coal job or the battery manufacturing facilities here, building those facilities here could compensate for job losses or create even more jobs than you were lost. But you have to have the mechanism to align those two things. And so training uh, programs, like education programs, um, so, but you will always have someone that feels like they lost. Um, and if you feel like you lost, you probably lost something, right? Like there are the people in, so Vermont is one of the most progressive states in the country, high, high opposition levels to wind because they don't want them close by. And so again, one of these paradoxes, but they feel that they lose by having wind there. Um, and I guess, I, I don't understand it, but if they feel like it's a loss, we have to consider it and figure out how to address that loss. 
And that's where policy, I think that policy intervention is where that comes in. How do we make sure that we can at least compensate the losers? Yeah, I, I agree with those points. And it's just a challenge of not wanting to do it here. Mm -hmm. So the local effect of mining in Maine for lithium would be real, but there'd be a positive effect on lithium production for this country rather than pushing it overseas. Same with a coal job getting displaced for a battery manufacturing job or a coal panel, man. but that's in China. And so, you know, Texas can't produce everything. We put up our hands for wind. We have so much wind in Texas and hot air too, but that's a different subject. But, you know, we can't produce everything. Everybody has to start doing these things. The challenge, the big fundamental energy concept that we haven't really mentioned yet is something called energy density. And that is your mic on. Thank you. Is my mic on? Oh, whoa. <laughs> the energy density. Uh, the reality is, and it's just physics, it's not judgmental, that the, the sun and the wind and biofuels and hydro are very low density forms of energy. What does that mean? It takes a lot of area or volume or weight to produce the same amount of energy as a uranium or thorium nuclear or natural gas, very dense. And it's like food, you know? So, it just takes more stuff. When you look at the amount of mining, the tons per terawatt hour that it takes to produce electricity from solar, wind, and things, it's just a lot more mining. And it's things like cement and steel and concrete and things that take a lot of heat. You can't this electrify everything. You can't make cement and steel with electricity. It, you need heat, a lot of heat. You have to burn molecules. So these, these words are cool, electrify everything, but that, okay, where's the steel and the cement going to come from, et cetera. So these are the trade-offs we talk about. And the local effects get very big. I mean, do the math real quick on electric vehicles, which, I, by the way, I think they're cool. Drove them in our first film. City is great, but let's just do the math. How many batteries, the size of your cell phone, a little bigger, are in one Tesla S? How many actual batteries, the size of your cell phone, are in one car? Anybody know? 7,000. The whole floor bed. There are 1.4 billion vehicles in the world today, and it's growing. Let's electrify half of them, which is the forecast by 2040. Half, 700 million cars or vehicles times 7,000, 4.9 trillion batteries. We have billions, 4.9 trillion. If I made 250,000 batteries every minute, 250,000 a minute, 24, 7, 365, it would take 37 years to make 4.9 trillion batteries. You can punch it into your calculator. I memorized it. Okay. <laughs> and they wear out before 37 years. You got to make them again. And that's half the fleet. So we've got to start to think about scale in these things. What are batteries good for? They have purpose. What are hydrogen fuel cells good for? No emissions out of the tailpipe, just like batteries, got to make the hydrogen. And even combustion engines are good for some things too, like the plane I'm going to fly in. It won't fly on batteries. Just too much weight from the batteries to lift that bird up with any humans on it. Elon doesn't fly his rockets on batteries. I think Scott's brought up a good point okay. and that's consumption. And what we haven't talked about yet is can we consume in perpetuity as we continue to grow in terms of population and energy? And I think it's pretty clear that the answers are no, right? We cannot <laughs> exponentially grow. We have to, to make those trade-offs somewhere. Yeah. So Thanks. I have a comment on that. Oh, comment, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you think about energy services, not energy fuels, so passenger kilo miles or lumen hours, as long as population grows, demand for those services will grow. Now, there are opportunities in developed countries to do conservation to reduce demand, but that's not true in developing countries, right? Demand for energy services is gonna grow because demand for energy services is gonna go in developing countries. And it would be unethical to suggest that it shouldn't. Um, 
So conservation, conservation, how long can we keep it up? I guess that's a question for humanity. <laughs> but conservation is I'm not saying it's not important, and it is particularly important in places like the US, but it is not going to get us out of this problem. We have a question over here. All right, so I think everybody's seen the charts of some non-firm power, especially like solar and wind, how their costs have declined almost exponentially over the past 20 years or so. You showed one of those charts earlier. Uh, there are some people who make the argument that those aren't really representative of their true costs on the grid today, because as you implement them, you really need to back them up with like baseload power or batteries, something more firm. So... I don't know, do you have any comments or are those graphs really that indicative of the reality or and should we be more skeptical of the true costs of those types of technologies? I'll dive into that one first because we kicked off a study a year ago called comparing electricity options. Great question. The, 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 those graphs show something called the LCOE, the levelized cost of electricity or energy. It's a Lazard calculation. So they're very real, but... It's at the plant gate or the bus bar. It's where the electricity is generated. It's not the cost to you. The cost to get it from there to you varies. If it's a nuclear power plant and very reliable and putting it on a grid, a little line loss. If I have to have something there when, when the wind goes away or night comes or other kinds of things, that thing, that backup thing is kind of redundant and it hangs out until those need times. So you're kind of doubling down on the infrastructure needed to make your electricity always there when you want it, which is what we all want in the rich world. And that adds cost. Um, I could leave it there, uh, but I think, I think that's your point is, is the cost to the consumer are higher and we have to be open about what we're showing when we show all the data. And, and those are good graphs. They're showing a lot. But we got to understand what that means and then what makes it reliable. Yeah. No, to be fair, right? Electricity prices, the fact that prices, the LCD is decreasing, it is indicative of things getting cheaper, right? Now, I showed battery costs decreasing. And so, batteries, which are important for the deployment of batteries, which is important for balancing very short term or high frequency variability is also decreasing. Uh, and very few more. You, you will have a hard time finding an energy systems expert, except for one, that will claim that the most cost effective way to reach net zero is through renewables only. I can only think of one person and uh, we all think, well, most of the people I know in the energy modeling world think it's crazy um, because there are, that's where a grid works, right? You have other resources. We think as nuclear not being able to provide some of that balancing, that's just our technical constraints because in, in France, they cycle nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible even to use nuclear power plants that way. Um, so I don't think a system that is 100% renewable is gonna be cheaper, uh, but we can definitely get to higher penetration levels and still be cost-effective. It's one of those and things again, partnerships. Right between what's needed to make things reliable, what's things for low emissions, et cetera. But when you look at the cost of electricity, it varies tremendously by state mm -hmm. and by country. California, I've been out there a couple of times this month, is paying a lot, 25, 30, 35 cents a kilowatt hour. Texas is eight to 10 cents. And, and most of, the, of Western Europe is 60 cents now, almost 10 X. And you say, yeah, well, well, yeah, rich people can afford it but if you're not rich it it's the economic term is regressive the lower income you make the more energy becomes part of that income whether it's gasoline or charging your car electricity whatever so it hurts the poorest among us the most when we increase the cost of basic needs that we all have to have and that is really important to manage and i think uh Gavin Newsom gets it. He kept 
He kept that nuclear power plant open, and it was the right, it was the right thing to do. See, uh, so which state has the highest electricity prices in the U.S.? Do you know? Right, why? All of it is oil, right? So, I mean, they're investing heavily in, in solar because they have a solar, right? But it isn't necessarily true that fossil fuel systems are cheaper, right? And in Rwanda, I lived in Rwanda for a year, the cost of electricity is 30 cents per kilowatt hour, and it's mostly diesel-based electricity. Um, so it, it, it depends a lot on the context and the system set up. And there's an equity issue with electricity costs, depending on where you are, which sector you're in. Um, so there's a, a debate, a conversation in, in the energy world, essentially about what happens when all of those who can afford to move to cleaner sources, who's left in the world, in the U.S., in the region and why, and what are they picking up the tab for economically, environmentally, and socially that others have sort of like vacated? And is that fair? And how can we address that now? All right, so really think about all those things. I hope you raise your hand for a three, maybe even a three plus or a four minus on your energy knowledge. I was <laughs> nice thinking work. that. I was thinking <laughs> that. You ask a question, then we have one up more. Over here. Um, so I know Dr. Um, Tinker mentioned judgment in his. Um, presentation and I'm also from Texas so I and this is my first time like living outside of Texas and I've noticed that the culture surrounding like the these topics is way different on like the east coast than it is in Texas so like I would just say I was just wanted to ask like do you find that pursuing this conversation is different regionally in the U.S. or like easier in certain parts and like what helps you to foster like healthy conversations about this topic in areas that might not be as receptive to it, such as like, in my opinion, the South? Right. right. I'm old and I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm here because of this. I, I go to the hard places. I lean into Berkeley and Harvard and Michigan and University of Colorado and Stanford and places where smart, smart people but they don't necessarily agree. That's what civil dialogue is all about. And I appreciate civility. It's great. I don't know everything. No one owns the truth. Remember, we just seek it. So that's why I do that. Um, I know what a lot of people in Texas think, but not in Austin. <laughs> Austin's different. You know, they think a lot like here. No, fine. So I actually have a similar question. Um, I'm not an environmental uh, student. I'm actually in English with like rhetoric and composition. So I'm very much also interested in the dialogue that people have about these energy issues. So I wanna get your guys' thoughts on what do you see as the biggest disconnects and like communication issues between like scientific research and people who are experts in the field and policy expertise and the general public? Like, what do you think on top of that up and coming environmentalists or people who want to look into these issues like logically to help both the community and the world as a whole, how can they also help contribute like positive dialogue to this situation? Um, so you know how Aurora said that if your job can be part of the climate effort. You're going to be a writer, your job definitely can be a part of the climate effort. I think we as scientists have failed at communicating science. Like that's just, we're failed at communicating the science of climate change as well as the science of vaccines, right? And some of it is like partisan discussions, but I think we just have not made the effort to communicate in ways that people can relate. It's hard. Like I think in scientific terms, it's hard for me to communicate in non-scientific terms. You're an English, actually you're a rhetoric expert you could work with someone like me to try to translate my science in a way. I actually think, I've been saying this for a while, that we need more research on science communication and what works and how do people absorb information and process information, which is like, if you're a psychologist major, I just gave you a career path. Uh, <laughs> how do people make decisions and absorb information? And so I don't have a great answer, but I think there's a role for people like you in that, in finding the solution. 
I think we failed at energy communication too. I really do. I, I was asked twice and first right when he started and two years later by Mr. Obama to be assistant secretary of energy and went up and visited and blah, blah, and, and decided not to. I didn't think I would have much impact there. I thought I could more if I worked to make films and and get things in the hands of educators and high schools and colleges around the world. It's just kind of as nonpartisan as we can make it. Here's some data, here's some, take you to the places, et cetera, to try to help give you the tools to think about these complex issues because they're complicated. And, and communication is a big piece of that. I think that, you know, we haven't mentioned ESG yet. You all know the term environmental social governance. It's, it's a big thing in boardrooms in the United States and Western Europe. It's driving some investing and stuff. We didn't mention the back to the question, the far side here, environmental justice is I think kind of where you were leading. If we continue to take all the mining and the drilling and the new to, to places that will accept them because they have to have the jobs and not where we don't want it. We don't want to see it. That's not just really. And, and so ESG in most of the world, it, it, the E in a lot of the places I visited would be some clean water or soil. The S would be a school that I could go to or perhaps a hospital or some healthcare. The governance piece might be not being under an autocrat and actually having a voice in the future of my city or my state or my country. That's ESG in a lot of them. And I think you all can play a huge role in that you know, recognizing the global circumstance and what most people are living with today. I also think rhetoric is very important to these conversations, right? And what you look at, if you sort of step back and look at energy conversations locally, nationally, globally, you see people falling into the same buckets that you would expect them to. The people who you see standing out are the ones who get out from what they're expected to do and have these shared conversations get into the hard work, right? Like go on PBS, go co-author an IPCC report, right? And, and actually like have those conversations and get to the solutions by not just falling back on the same old, same old. So I would challenge you and everyone else to write, don't, don't just fall into, oh, I, I work for government, I have to say this. I work for an environmental advocacy firm, I need to do this. I work for business, I have to say this, right? When you get out of that, space, you actually do the hard work of, of having the all angles conversation. Thanks, Aurora. I'm sensitive to the time. And so I'm looking at my watch and we have six minutes. So I've got two students at this table who have been waiting a while. And if we could just get to these last two questions and then um, we can wrap up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I had a question going back to what you said about like nuclear, how essential it is, or you believe that it's essential to like carbon neutrality. So what do you think like, the policy how does that impact like actual engineering where you have a country like france they have all these nuclear reactors but they're kind of coming up to the end of their lifetime so they're trying to switch to renewable energy but you have this other argument where if you keep the nuclear you could have a better chance of doing that or even just at the end of a nuclear reactor's like or the actual like once you run out of uranium we tend to just toss it somewhere or whereas other countries they can refine it and use like the plutonium or go through these other processes so for us you have like that 20 percent uranium restriction so there's all these like different policies right. going towards nuclear so what do you think is like the one thing that the united states could do policy-wise that could help the engineering behind getting more nuclear can i just say something we don't just toss. That's right. <laughs> the, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> right. All of the nuclear waste in a power plant remains in that power plant after it's used. So um, there's a power plant, a nuclear power plant, um, Beaver Beaver Valley, not so far from here. I think it's being decommissioned. The nu that nuclear plant has been operating for over 30 years, and all of the waste from that nuclear plant is there. So we're not just tossing it around. We are not recy re like recycling uh, or repurposing. So that, that is true. Um, what can the U.S. do? So we need to bring the cost of nuclear down, right? Nuclear right now is expensive. But if we don't invest in the technology, like one of the challenges that the nuclear sector has is there's no experts anymore. There are no people with expertise designing or building the nuclear plants. And so 
if we don't have the people that can do it, it's going to be more expensive to do it, right? And so you have to, this idea of learning by doing is really important. And that may mean that we, and the first plants are going to be expensive. The first plants for coal and natural gas were expensive when they were first built because we have lost that expertise with nuclear. Um, so I do think there's the U.S. has to be open to the possibility of nuclear, and that means investing in the workforce for nuclear and in their, getting that expertise and practice, right? Like, you, if you're an engineer and then you you never use your engineering skill, you're like you're not gonna keep them, and and 50 years from now you can use them, right? So we actually have to have people that work on these projects. And one of the costs of nuclear, I think, is fear of radiation and, and the word nuclear. It's kind of scary. Um, we take you to La Hague in France in our first film switch. We go inside and show you the whole inner workings. And yes, it's in swimming pools and dry cask and being stored, vitrified and stored. Um, the I think I'm, I'm encouraged your generation doesn't seem to be as fearful of nuclear as my generation was because we were trained to be. It wasn't climate for us, it was nuclear for me. I got under desks in kindergarten for nuclear war. We practiced that drill every week and it was terrifying. Didn't know what that meant. So getting over the fear helps to mitigate some of the costs, the real costs of accelerating technologies and moving into next gen nuclear things, which are much more inherently safe than the things we have today. Uh, on the energy switch, our PBS, I've met, not in person yet, um, a senior in college at University of Wisconsin, who's gonna come on and, and she's a nuclear engineer and she happens to be Miss Wisconsin. I thought this is cool as hell. You know, here's somebody who's studying nuclear engineering right now in university in the US. Let's bring her on and have somebody else who's a little more fearful of it, and have a dialogue about why. You know, what got you there? Why are you here? Let's talk about these things and hopefully that'll help to make it kind of cool again to go do that, right? Are you a student in the nuclear engineering program here? Okay. Not just electrical, <laughs> electrical engineering. But Pitt does have a nuclear engineering <laughs> yeah. program. Yeah, it's awesome. I sit next to the only a test reactor at UT. I'm the closest office to a nuclear test reactor on our campus. Doesn't rather, bother me a bit. I would rather be there than next to a coal power plant. Uh, every day. Yep. Howdy. Um, Y'all have mentioned natural gas several times, but the emissions of natural gas and oil or coal are quite different. So I'm thinking about like methane versus CO2 and the relative impact they have on global temperatures. Um, can y'all talk about how those different impacts will factor into what sources of energy we might pursue moving forward? Um, how, for example, availability in like Africa um, might impact ways we develop energy sources in Africa? Okay. So are you talking about our models or like how do we in a research account for like those impacts, like? I'm thinking, so even beyond research in terms of actual develop, like economically or looking at policy, where we might want to focus on developing future energy sources. So looking at what the relative impact on global temperatures will be from the emissions of a CO2 producer versus a methane producer. Yeah, okay. Do you have? I could take, I could start and then you can yeah. supplement because you'll do a better job. <laughs> um, uh, so some, some, just some facts real quick. I know we're short on time. When you burn a methane molecule, it releases CO2. Uh, energetically about half of the amount of CO2 is when you burn coal. And that's a real general statement because not all coal is created equal, blah, blah, blah. It's a greenhouse gas. It lasts in the atmosphere, CO2, for 100 years. Methane itself is a greenhouse gas, more potent and intense. It doesn't last as long, but they're both greenhouse gases, and we have to keep them both at bay. So just substituting coal with gas, if you don't, if you leak methane, doesn't help that much. You got to get cranked down on the methane too, and companies are doing that more in the rich 
regulated world than they are in the less regulated world. So there's a piece of the kind of the physics of it in terms of greenhouse gas terms. The other things though that aren't in methane that are in coal are important too. And I'm not anti-coal. Coal's lifting a big chunk of our planet from poverty right now, mostly Asia, which I'm doing some bad things for the environment for sure and the climate, but it's also doing some good things for people. So always we have to remember, it's not just let's all become climate conscious, it's also become poverty conscious. And I think we'll solve for two variables. We have to keep those two, that dual challenge in mind at all times so that we don't accidentally do something really good here that really hurts there. And we look back and go, damn it, you know, could have done this and it wouldn't have had that effect. So I would say, as you're thinking about gas versus solids, typically you're just energetically better and less impacts from a lot of other things when you burn them. I'm happy to talk about the gas resources, which is a whole different conversation because you sit on a massive Marcellus play here in this basin of gas for this country and the world. And, and that's a whole kind of different discussion about that. So I found something in which we disagree. Good, yeah. I am not for coal. I am against coal. Yeah. Um, but I think you're asking also about what's appropriate here may not be appropriate somewhere else, right? And so decisions are context specific within a global framework or within a global system, right? So New York ban um, fracking. You can agree or disagree with the policy. Maybe New York felt they have other options. That does not mean that Mozambique should ban uh, natural gas production. You have to look at what other alternatives they have um, in terms of other energy resources, what portfolio of options are, are available. You have to look at cost, right? Now, I, um, I strongly believe that net uh, zero poverty also means we need to address climate change because climate change is going to cause poverty. Uh, so, but there is a discussion of who pays for these things. If, if, if we don't want, now I'm very concerned, for example, about the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have a lot of peat. Uh, and peat is, you would know better, but it's basically worse than coal. It is coal that hasn't really gone the full process. So it's way even more carbon intensive. It's burning your garden. Right. Yeah. And they have opened, the DRC is opening leases, like selling permits for international companies to go and mine the peat. That would be catastrophic for the climate. Uh, but we can't tell the DRC, this is a source of income for a very poor country. So can we pay the DRC to not produce, right? And so if we have to look at that context and when we think about the options and the opportunities, we have to think about that. And so I'm less clear about whether, we probably should not ban Mozambique from producing natural gas, we're not going to ban the DRC for producing peat, but we can take action to support the efforts to eliminate peat or to prevent peat production. Okay, great questions. Please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank all of you also for sitting here, for listening rapidly, for having some amazing questions. I think you undersold your, your own energy expertise. Uh, in the beginning, and I personally want to thank our speakers for having some great rhetoric, some agreeing, disagreeing, but but also showcasing how they're, these are complicated conversations, complicated systems with a lot of So before, before everyone leaves, I just have one, one last thing, right? <laughs> There's a lot of caveats and a lot of, but you have to consider these and it's a complex system. It doesn't mean it's not solvable. And so, it is complicated and you have to be informed and you have to think critically, but you should not leave here and saying, well, it's too complicated. I can't do anything about it. That is not the message. I think we would want you to leave here with. <laughs>